it's a it's a couple we'll pack minutes after so we'll go ahead and get officially started but carrie we might have you kind of rehash that here and we can cover it here in the beginning too uh, because we have had others ask about the waivers too so we were for those that joined just joined the call we were just having a little bit of discussion before the actual presentation began so we'll make sure and and cover that information because i think it's important um so want to welcome everybody to the swing bed uh, July education program today and glad you could join. I do ask that you do open up chat and add in your name oh, yeah, and I'm hospital so that we and Carolyn or okay, we we've order. got some background noise going on. I believe yeah. that's coming from uh, Carrie's Carrie? phone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um so we um um would like to be able to take an accurate attendance. We do need to report um back to our uh, contractors that support the funding for these education programs. So please do that for us. And we would really appreciate that. Likewise, if you have any questions, use that chat function, chat it in. Carrie is going to talk here a little bit about waivers. So besides long COVID, be thinking about questions you have around waivers. Um, but if you do have any issues uh, with Zoom, let me know uh, by, um, emailing me or chatting in and we will, IRHA does a great job. Ali Orwig helps support Zoom behind the background and, and really does a nice job of making sure that the quality of the webinar is, is as good as it can be for a virtual event. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Becky Royer and I am a consultant for the Indiana Hospital Association and uh, support the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project or MBQIP for the State Office of Rural Health. And as always, we want to thank Joyce Fullenworth and David Conrad for all of their support from the state office to allow these education programs and conversations uh, to be ongoing. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Dunning. Um, Carrie is our swing bed consultant that we've been working with probably for almost three years now. And um, we've got some really good swing bed programs across the state, lots of interest in the swing bed programs growing. And um, a lot of that is due to Carrie's knowledge and support and the information that she's provided along the way through uh, the pandemic and making sure that we're all very aware of the COVID waivers and understanding the ins and outs. So Carrie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And Becky, remind me at the end about the waivers if I drop that off my brain. Okay. Um, I, I am going to apologize and immediately. Uh, I got a, a call at 4 a.m. this morning that the heads had walked in to survey a nursing home that was three hours away from me. So I got in the car to come up and support them, uh, which means that one, I'm talking from my phone and two, I'm in an office where there might be somebody coming in and out and they don't realize I'm on the phone um, other than they may see my mouth moving. So I will try and warn them as quickly as possible, but I, I apologize for that up front. Uh, so we are going to talk about long COVID, uh, which is an increasingly important issue. Um, and we're getting some numbers from uh, across the pond, as they say, uh, where they've already seen about 49% of those who've had COVID, regardless of age, regardless of whether they had sniffles or they were on a vent, uh, that's crossing all of those. Um, they're coming back with what we call long COVID, which are symptoms again, but they hang on and on and on. Um, so, Becky, if you go to the first slide where the Indiana is shown there, this is the COVID-19 numbers. And I put this on here because I don't know, you all may know that this is available. I, I use it for all the states. Um, but this happened to be one that I, um, I picked out from the, the week of um, the 4th. Uh, and you can see uh, when I highlighted one of the counties uh, that it gave the information uh, for that county. And you can see from underneath there that there's uh, yellow, orange, and red um, as the COVID numbers are picking up again across the country with this uh, new variant. Uh, I have the website there. If you're not using that, that may be something that you wanna see uh, use as a comparison um, for the state of Indiana. And some of you that are on borderlines, you know, uh, with Illinois or um, um, 
what, Kentucky, I think, and so forth, you may want to look at the states, nearby states, just to see what's going on, to see, be prepared for uh, increasing uh, COVID numbers. So what we're going to do um, beyond that is that's increasing number of people that are getting COVID in the first place. And I was just on a call a couple of weeks ago where someone asked a physician what was the best way to avoid long COVID, and his answer was don't get COVID in the first place. Uh, that's how um, it is crossing all these lines. And CDC now has a, out 28 conditions um, that they use as main reasons for long COVID. And so it's not one area. So we will be talking a little bit about that. <laughs> and if you uh, go to the next slide, uh, this I find uh, fairly interesting because it shows the clusters of the diagnosis from um, the, the U09.9, .9, which is the COVID diagnosis. Uh, but these are the things that are occurring most frequently. And you'll see cardiopulmonary um, neurology, and then you'll see um, the third one of the clusters is um, metabolic. I would tell you um, nationally and internationally, it's cardiopulmonary uh, um, and neurology, and they've actually separated it at the national level to cardiology and pulmonology and neurology as the three specialists uh, that you might need. So for those of you in rural areas that uh, are having COVID issues and or potential long COVID issues, uh, the value of the telehealth these days and telemedicine uh, will be very important as we go forward uh, with all of things we're learning from COVID because those are the three primary uh, specialists. The fourth one that anyone would add to this right now is in fact all the, the national and international groups are in, are adding um, psychiatry, and that's because almost to a person there is uh, fatigue, malaise, and or depression uh, with the long COVID cases. So trying to deal with that um, has become a kind of a forefront conversation when I'm on the call with some of the national committees. Uh, but you can look under there and um, and see what the clusters of types of patients that are showing up from that. On the next slide, um, we're talking about post-COVID conditions. And again, um, these can last weeks, months, or years. Uh, Europe is now rolling into their third year of tracking long COVID because remember they started a year and a half, almost two years with the huge amount of um, uh, COVID before we had it on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and they have some that they've been studying for three years with long COVID. So that's why it's an unknown entity. Uh, and again, you might have had a mild case of, of COVID and you might be 22 years old and still end up with a, uh, a post-COVID or a long COVID that lasts for, for months. There is no rhyme or reason to any of this. They are found uh, more often in people who had severe uh, COVID. And I would tell you that the other risk is the older patients. Uh, they're actually in Europe are cutting it off at 62 and above. We sometimes in the U.S. because of Medicare do 65 and above. Uh, but so if they've had um, a serious bout with COVID and they're older, then they are um, likely to have more of the long COVID uh, chances of dealing with multiple issues, actually. The important thing I want you to take from this is there's no single test for this. There's no one thing we can say, well, let's just draw blood and we can figure out they have long COVID. Uh, it's going to come from a variety of these conditions. It's going to come from all sorts of things. Um, age will play some part in it. Um, gender uh, may play some part in it. Um, there are some diagnoses uh, that are more prevalent for female. I think that's probably uh, pulmonary right now. Cardiology seems to be more male. But again, you can't even say that that's going to stand up. If you look at the next slide, right now in, in the U.S., it's approximately one in five adults that are 18 and over will have a condition that will fit one of these categories. Um, the numbers are coming down pretty quick. So for those over um, 65, it's actually uh, in some parts of the country gone in one in three. Um, and the total numbers in some parts of our country right now are one in four adults. So um, this is an older slide um, and that's how fast everything is changing. What I like about it is you can see immediately uh, that it impacts all parts of our major systems in our body. So there is no one way to be looking at it. But um, why I have it up this way is to remind you that sometimes we're having to educate our uh, PCPs, our primary physicians, 
because they, I've had some in some area go, I don't even know what long COVID is. And if you're having that in any of your areas, you need to get this information out to them that there is, and it's, and it's a, got a formal name now, which I'll tell you in a few minutes, but it is something that's going to hit all of our areas in the country. So we need to have our primary care uh, physicians um, educated. And then I think we need to start looking at what kinds of cases we're having and how we're going to access the specialists uh, for those areas. So if you look at the next page, these uh, are the most commonly reported um, symptoms that we have seen. Um, again, this, these are changing because this is an early stage uh, report, um, but it is important that you um, look at the uh, total list here. There are a number of people, younger as well as older, where you see on that first column that brain fog is a key of this, that they actually are very confused um, and the other thing that uh, comes up a lot is joint pain, which is in the second column. It says pain, but joint pain. Um, but that in itself, either of those, if somebody is 78 and they come in with brain fog, um, I'm not sure we're going to think COVID. We may start thinking COVID first, but we're going to probably say, well, they're aging and they've got potential dementia or Alzheimer's starting, et cetera, et cetera, which is why this list has been put out, which are, these are um, common uh, side effects of many of the diseases that we are dealing with uh, these days. So that's an interesting list to talk over with the doctors. The next slide um, I think is important. Uh, this is actually from Ireland. I'm working on an international uh, group right now. This was uh, North Ireland. Um, they had tracked it this way. But do you see that? So it's not just they have one of those things that we just listed. Uh, all of these uh, patients, there were nine patients that were studied they had multiple of these issues and they're all a little different. Um, there is a brain fog in all of them, regardless again of the ages, uh, but you see there's a, a number of uh, system issues that are involved in that. So again, this is gonna be hard to study and track. Um, and that's where I wanna go to the next slide and start talking about what are we gonna be doing with long COVID um, in rural health? So first, the evidence right now is suggesting that we um, look at the infection and subsequent mortality in rural communities because it seems to be running higher than what is running, uh, what is being recorded in the urban areas. I think there's some good reasons for that. A couple of them we'll talk about here in a second. The other thing is, um, what are you seeing um, as the list of patients who came in with COVID just right now as a starting point, you could take all your um, COVID diagnosis, primary COVID diagnoses, and break them down, uh, run the last two years, 20, certainly from March 2020 on um, uh, through 22, that would give you two years of data. What are the primary diagnoses that they came into your hospital with? Because they vary within the state, but they certainly vary um, state to state. And if you see that, I'll say 30% of them are pulmonary, that maybe is where you start with the education and looking at long COVID. But it'd be interesting for you to have your own uh, statistics. The next part is the symptoms and severity um, are changing. It can be mild, it can be severe, it can be age-related, not age-related. Um, but all of them, what they, the conclusion is that everyone, regardless of age and the severity of this, are having mental health, social function, and um, uh, issues. And a lot of that comes back to the ability to work, particularly those who have not retired or have chronic uh, health conditions. If you can't go to work uh, for a number of months, that has consequences that are pretty severe, financially, socially, uh, mentally, and so forth. So there is uh, a component there, which is why they're saying psychiatry is gonna have to be part of the, the team as we develop this out. There are gaps in employment uh, that can happen, uh, particularly more in rural areas uh, as COVID went through plants, or for instance, um, if it hits a, a certain part of your population, let's say farmers, uh, then there's an economic impact to uh, the rural community. And in some of those areas, it's already been pretty substantial. Um, uh, I know in, in Georgia, for instance, and I was there last week looking at a facility and they have, um, chicken processing plants right around them, five major ones, and COVID ran through one of those, um, and that shut down some of the 
production, then it shut down some of the jobs and it just rolls on and on. So that's something for you to consider also. The other thing that's important is employment also can be linked uh, for our younger workers to directly to insurance. Um, so if they're out of work, you know, when does their insurance plan kick into a long uh, insurance plan or did they pay for that? Uh, and that means we may have people that um, are getting these health care expenses but do not have insurance covering them anymore. And then the bottom line is even with insurance, and we can say this because we've been talking a lot about Medicare Advantage versus Medicare, traditional Medicare patients, um, and what people are paying for. So the diagnostic testing, the treatment plans, the, the uh, pharmaceuticals that will be needed, uh, the ongoing PT, OT, maybe respiratory therapy that might be needed, that will be a financial barrier for a lot of your patients, and how are we going to handle that? Uh, the next um, slide, Becky. Um, what we're seeing in many states where uh, COVID, long COVID has been identified already, um, some of them in the Northeast, California is already doing this. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in the Midwest. I'll let you guys tell me um, either now or through some emails. Uh, they're beginning to start COVID clinics. Um, and what they are, are clinic set up with a multidisciplinary team uh, with a physician available. Um, and then they're trying to not only diagnose, uh, but treat the patient, figure out what the primary issues that person has to deal with. And that may be, what will it take for this person to go back to work? What will it take for this person to live it alone um, by themselves? We are seeing the COVID clinics primarily in urban areas uh, because the numbers of COVID patients, obviously the percentage is much higher than we're seeing in, in many of our rural areas. Um, but, uh, we are also seeing when we have the clinics in the areas that 73% of those reporting um, have obstacles into treating patients, and that's right now a lack of clinical resources. In other words, if somebody has four or five of these side effects or conditions that CDC has identified, where are they going to get help? And they can't go one place, and uh, who's paying for this, and how can patients afford it? And so what are we going to be um, doing about this is obviously we're in the first stages of we're all learning uh, together. So then on top of it, uh, when we're providing care in uh, rural areas, we have uh, a higher number of uninsured individuals. And so our payer mix is already slanted towards government sources, meaning Medicare um, and Medicaid primarily. And so this puts a strain on it because as you know, we have limits in uh, the days they can stay in a skill program, the, the days they're supposed to stay in uh, acute, the uh, visits that are allowed for uh, PT or OT. Um, so we have already limits put on us, and that means if people need more than that, then who's paying for that? And that's putting quite a strain, not only on the individual, but certainly on the health system. <clears throat> and what I want you to take from this is not just the red letters, but start looking at what is this going to mean for your community and what things can you do creatively um, to work with patients. I know that um, during the Ebola uh, crisis that we had, it was actually really limited in the states, but this, the, uh, Washington, D.C. had a uh, huge amount of Ebola because we have so many uh, foreign visitors to the D.C. area that either working or visiting um, there, and they set up Ebola clinics and then figured out how to get pharmaceutical companies to uh, provide the medications and so forth. So they had to get creative, and I'm suggesting that that may be where we're going to have to get uh, creative going forward. So I want to go to this next slide, and here's where we start. And if you listen to all that, it's overwhelming. I'm, I get overwhelmed listening to an hour conversation with 12 doctors on it, and, you know, where, where do you even go? So that's, I want to try and take it back to what's going on in your area. So for the start right now, there's an uh, estimate, I love this because nobody knows, 7.7 to 23 million uh, people in the U.S. that are now post-COVID, uh, the initial bout with COVID. Some of them have even had it two and three times. Uh, the numbers are actually higher in Europe. Uh, the percentage of the millions are higher. Um, so my first question is, how are we tracking um, this diagnosis? Have you, uh, as a hospital or a hospital system or a swing bed program, pulled your numbers to see what percentage of COVID admissions you've had. Again, maybe last year and the year before, if you want to do them separately. 
Um, and if you can track the diagnoses, are you going back and looking at the main symptom or symptoms that um, helped you identify uh, COVID patients or those symptoms that brought COVID patients into your ED or into uh, a PCP office? We need to get our own data so we know what we're facing. One, that's good information for you to have just to know about COVID in general. Uh, we're beginning to see people get COVID two times and three times and four times now. Um, and now if we're gonna get long COVID on top of it, we need to know our starting point. Uh, you also need to start tracking treatment opportunities and that can be local, it can be all the way up to the uh, statewide. Um, I know in Indiana, you're in systems, uh, a big hospital systems there. There may be resources there, plus they probably have access to a lot more information than many rural hospitals would have by themselves. That you can start asking, you know, what are we seeing statewide in, in our hospital system? Um, and what are our opportunities and what are our resources going to be? You may already know that, uh, but start talking about the long COVID uh, piece of that. So at a basic level, you need to know the percentage of COVID patients that have come through um, Hold on a second. So I'll get it later. So you can look, um, I'm getting people staring at me in the window so uh, and asking me questions. I told you it was going to be a weird day. Um, so you need to know the percentage of COVID patients and you now need to start looking to see if you've had long COVID and what percentage um, are being diagnosed with long COVID. And if you don't think you've had long COVID yet, has it been missed as maybe a repeat visit of a, a prior COVID patient? And maybe they had symptoms a little longer. Maybe they had it for three months or four months or five months the second time. And that may actually fit the long COVID um, standing at this point. And then you have to understand the continuum of care uh, that you already have. What services do you have in your continuum? So that means you have acute, you have swing beds, uh, you have outpatient services. Um, do you have psych services available? Do you have rural health clinics in your area? If you're in a system, do you refer out for certain diagnoses to larger hospitals within your system? You kind of have to have a better uh, written organization and understanding that so that we can um, start identifying how patients are going to move through your hospital to others if that is needed. Many of these patients will go home but they will not be able to go anywhere or do anything for a long time period. So how are we gonna deal with that? Is that home health? Is that community resources? People bringing in food, maybe providing transportation. And then the last thing that everybody is talking about, nobody has a solution yet, will be finding funding to take care of a uh, higher percentage. So if it's over 65 and it's right now in the US one out of every three patients, that's 33% of uh, over 65 in your community that in fact could get or likely to get uh, long COVID. And so we've got to discuss funding for this. Can we get things donated to people if that's needed? Like again, working with pharmaceutical companies is the first thing that comes to mind, but there are other supplies. Um, the federal government is working on this. Uh, Medicare is trying to, or CMS is trying to address it, uh, but nobody has a, a solution and those in Europe um, they actually have uh, more coverage through uh, their um, managed care plans in Europe than we have in the U.S. And so they're tracking some of that data now and trying to figure out what they're going to do uh, long term. Um, I will say again and repeat, we just as we were in March of 2020, we're sort of in that new horizon of things that we've never gone through before, um, and at least in this generation. So uh, we've got some things to look for, and I think the best way to start taking control of it is if you have numbers, by the time we start talking about funding from state or federal governments, you will have numbers in place to show how uh, significant the issues might be in your particular area. Um, so Becky, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are questions and then we'll go back to the waiver question. Uh, one question that came in was, are you seeing in other states uh, critical access hospitals admitting directly to the swing bed once a skilled need is identified as opposed to inpatient care? So that goes back to the waiver question. And yes, they have been doing that. Um, if you didn't hear it earlier, Zach and I were in a conversation just before we started about Indiana suspending the waivers. Um, and what did that mean for the federal level? Um, and I, I think that's up to your own compliance departments in your 
a hospital, I will not say one way or the other. I will say uh, we don't know, for instance, if the three-day is going to be in place again. Um, now, after July 15th is the next time uh, the public health emergency document has to be signed. If it's not signed, then that means the waivers are totally gone. But what they've been doing, thankfully, is kind of taking some away at a time. So the last one that was signed, they, they took some away immediately, then at 30 days, and then at 60 days. And so now we're hitting that 90 day mark for a new sign. Um, and when it comes out, then we'll know uh, whether the, the three day waiver is still covered or not. But what Zach uh, raised as a question was that Indiana has gotten rid of the state waivers. Um, and I'm just gonna say off the top of my head, there has always been this sort of simple solution that whatever was the tougher of the two rules between state and federal, that's the one you followed. So if Indiana has given up all its waivers, um, it might behoove you to look at not uh, taking patients without that three-day requiring state, even though the federal government has not reduced that waiver at this point. But that's just a suggestion. I have no way of knowing what's going to work for each of your hospitals. Another question is, Carrie, have you heard any more about the three-day qualifying stay requirement no longer being needed? Uh, we won't know that until July 15th. It's in place right now. You could, in reality, use it as a federal uh, waiver, um, but July 15th, when that is signed, we'll see if they are continuing with the three-day waiver um, or if they're going to end that waiver. Um, and from that, there have been discussions about is the three-day requirement still needed in at all? Um, right. But that's not a discussion that's going to end on July 15th. That's going to be a discussion that has to go through regulatory changes. Um, I think it's an undercurrent right now, um, but I can't say where that's going to end up at this point. Okay. I think I think that's what they were referring to. You had yeah, to that's why I went back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What other questions do we have? Um, please chat them in or simply unmute your line and feel free to jump in, but we want to make sure we get everything addressed for you today. Do have a question, Carrie. If we admit a patient today to swing bed without a three-day stay, will his entire stay in swing bed be covered using the waivers, assuming the yes. waivers expire on the 15th? Yes. So it's anything before July 15th at the federal level. Um, they can't take away a waiver until it's actually signed. And that document, uh, the PHE on July 15th, will be signed as to what's still uh, on a waiver program. And that's multiple things, that, by the way, that are included in that document. It'll probably be six or seven pages long. Um, so, yes, um, the question gets if he goes out to the hospital and is out and you discharge him, let's say, on the 14th and he comes back on the 15th, that would be more you're going to have to be careful at that point because it would be the 15th, sometime on the 15th that we should know. Um, but if they drop the waiver at that point, I would say the second part of his stay would not uh, fall under a waiver. And that would be an interesting complication at that point and how they would go back to the first one. I think we could win that one uh, on appeal. I think they hopefully they'll put something in writing that says any uh, stay, you know, and anything that was you know, less than a 48 hour discharge can come back in under that original waiver. Um, but that's the complication of all these waivers and letting them go. It's not simple. It's uh, very complex to go back and figure out how we're going to handle things. Another question is, uh, in Europe, have they noticed long COVID typically ceasing at some point? And I think what they mean uh, by that is how long does it, long COVID typically last for most patients? I don't, I haven't seen an average, but I think everybody's stunned that we've got 28 conditions out there that we're not looking at one or two things. Uh, and they're trying to separate it out by conditions. They're trying to separate it by age and gender. So we're doing kind of a lot of scrambling at this point. Um, I, I know for a lot of the uh, younger patients that I have seen in U.S. studies to this point, um, they've had it up to a couple months fairly routinely. So it isn't something that lasts a day or a week. It's lasting at least two to three months. And that's why they started looking at what is this going on. That's the long COVID. I suspect when we actually get some enough data in, um, because it's now going to be recognized 
uh, where we had just thought, you know, this is ongoing. This is now sort of a, a different topic we're dealing with, um, that we will see that older people are going to have longer events. Uh, the ones in, in um, Europe uh, mostly have been older people, but there have been some 40-year-olds in that the, the one- and two-year issues also. So again, the, the thing that's um, stunning about this and frustrating about this is it's every age, it's all these conditions, so all the major parts of our body, and there's no pattern to it that can be identified at this point. Something that is a question for me is, you talked about finding funding. <clears throat> Are there any suggestions from a federal level of places to kind of go and look, say that if a um, rural area is thinking about starting uh, a COVID clinic? Well, I think they're going to get that information up, Becky. I don't think they have anything out specifically. People have been scrambling at this point, but it would be looking at the resources in your community. For instance, if you have something like a, a rural health clinic, an RHC, what can be provided through that service that isn't an inpatient or outpatient service at, at the hospital specifically or a swing bed specifically? In other words, what's your range of services that could continue to help a person? Can somebody go from um, swing and a lot of people uh, in the programs that have an RHC attached are going to RHC because they're using that as their primary physician because they didn't have a primary physician. When they come out of that RHC, can they go to outpatient rehab? I think we're going to have to see how this strings out. We're going to have one of those diagrams look like a spaghetti uh, model where we've got people going in, in different directions. That's one thing. I think the other thing, um, the feds are talking about it. Uh, it's just not going to be fast moving. Um, they, I think they actually moved very fast uh, with the pandemic stuff when they came out in March of 2020. That was as fast of a, as I've seen them move in my lifetime. So I, I know they're looking at this and trying to work through it. Um, and then there will be some state level things that may come up also. Um, you may have access in your area to some free clinics. Uh, we might be talking to them and who's running them because you don't want to overload them, but how can they help? And I would even go down to how are we going to help people? Can we get our civic groups and our church groups um, helping with food, uh, transportation, some of those basics that uh, people are going to need to get the care um, going forward? Um, and the other thing that I've seen in a couple of areas, uh, which I think is kind of cool, uh, they've kind of restarted call trees calling people that have had COVID, checking on them at home. And that doesn't have to be hospital only. That can be volunteers um, to see if they're feeling all right. Because if somebody's staying at home and not knowing what they have, um, that can lead to some consequences if they don't get what they need sooner than later. Another comment that came in is, I noticed fatigue was a part of um, each of the patients in the slide um, that you had shared. Um, is um, is this going to cause an increased uh, need for physical therapists in hospitals? Yes, um, I think so. Um, um, Illinois and Becky, you can get the information from Pat uh, pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we just did a, um, a webinar for a couple, I don't know, it was three or four hour webinar, but she had two um, staff people from hospitals that had started clinics, um, and one of them was a PT. Um, so you might want to get that information directly from Pat. Uh, I think they have it taped, and they probably have some information from those two that could be used as resources. So they've actually started up their own clinics already, and, and they were two different hospitals. Uh, on that tape, if you get that, there's also two different physicians that speak and um, no offense if there are any physicians on um, on the call, but they actually spoke in English. Um, so they were giving very concrete ideas for things that people could be doing. And, and so I think that would be something. And I know, um, uh, Becky, that we're expanding that. We're doing another one of those in a couple months, and we have some meetings on that. So that might be something that you can attach to with that. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda Webb from Pulaski asked, would this be covered under CCM? You know, Linda? that's a good question. Um, I don't know why it wouldn't, I mean, but I don't know specifically. So I have just written that down. I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, and let me see. Um, 
what some of my resources say. Okay. Thanks for asking it. That's the stuff we need because, you know, you just can't think through this. Everybody's still trying to wrap their head around the whole concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Opening up for more questions. We have just, we have a couple minutes left. Did I wear everybody out with that conversation? Because it's wearing me out. No, I, very good thought, you know, just in how even to, uh, from a swing bed program perspective, you know, how they can better support their communities by caring for those long COVID patients. And, you know, not a lot of people want to go to a skilled nursing facility or long-term care facility because of COVID concerns. And, um yeah. Can hospitals work with their local physicians to admit to the swing bed program as opposed to, you know, admitting to a skilled facility if all of the right, you know, admitting criteria is there? Right. So, well, one other thing to think through with that, Becky, is in reality, if they have um, Medicare aid coverage, they could stay up to 100 days. And that has not been the model for swing beds. In fact, we've discouraged that model and said that's more of a skilled nursing model. I'm not saying they have to, and I'm not suggesting that you do that. I'm saying in theory, um, because they're admitted under a diagnosis that is not um, getting taken care of quickly, they can stay longer. Now, what that might mean if you have uh, start having long COVID to a higher percentage in your communities or your immediate market area, you might want to look for those of you that particularly are used to two week stays and say, what does this mean? Does this mean we need to start looking out towards 30 days, which would be a pretty big jump for all of you, you know, to go from a two week stay to, you know, a 25 to 30 day stay. But I think you need to have those discussions. Um, or is there going to be a nursing home in the area that's not filled up already um, that can take these patients not knowing how long they're going to need uh, those services? So there's a lot of, um, we're not sure how we're going to pull it off, but we need to have those conversations. So I'd start in your, your own facility and say, what are we comfortable handling? Um, you know, some, a lot of this is pulmonary. So do we have a pulmonologist or do we have access via telemedicine to a pulmonologist? Do we have RT uh, as well as PTOT, maybe speech available? So I, that's why I kind of put this out as I hope it raises, rarely do I say this, but I hope it raises more questions than it answers uh, because you're going to have to look uniquely at your situation and start trying to address what you can control at this moment. In other words, what do we think we're going to have? What have we had in the past year as far as COVID patients? Um, and then as this evolves, uh, we will figure out how uh, the whole world's going to handle it. We can drop that down back to your local level. Thanks, Gary. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, stay tuned on um, July 15th is when we're supposed to hear about the federal waivers and uh, whether they will continue or not. And if you have questions as we go, why email me? I will get that out. Likewise, if you want to think about looking for funding to support um, some work around long COVID, let me know. I'll connect you with Joyce Fellenworth, who's a great resource. And one other question uh, that came into chat is, I understand that Indiana Medicaid does not participate in swing bed. Does that include as a secondary payer source as well? Becky, I'm gonna have to defer that to you, know, because I don't keep up with 50 states and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would think that um, one, of the, one of the guys at the state level should know that, that have been following the swing bed program. I will follow up and see what the answer is. Yeah, yeah, there, it, it Medicaid's so different in every state. I, I've given up. My brain can only hold so much. Yeah. I may get long COVID from trying to study long COVID, you know. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we'll follow yeah. up on the CCM coverage and Medicaid as a secondary payer. And hopefully we'll have answers to those when we send out the recording to the event. 
uh, here in the next couple of days. And uh, the presentation was uh, shared this morning uh, to everyone that was in the original invitation. So if there are others uh, you would like to have it available to in your organization, feel free to forward that on as well as the recording link. So I want to thank everybody for their time today and um, their uh, questions and interaction on the call. And thanks to Carrie for always helping keep us right on track and keeping us up to date on the most current events. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.